Welcome to Season 2 of The Bean Pod, a podcast about decentralized finance and the Beanstalk Protocol. I'm your host, Rex. Before we get started, we'd like to again remind everyone that we here at the podcast are super bullish about Beanstalk Protocol and other DeFi projects. But as we've seen time and time again, this is still a risky space. So with that in mind, always do your own research before investing in a project, including anything covered here in the podcast, and never ever invest funds that you can't afford to lose. And with that, on with the show. Crypto and DeFi are rife with clever projects, products, and services. Investment options, lending capabilities, yield aggregation. In some ways, the list kind of goes on and on. But in other ways, a lot of progress is still out on the horizon. One of the best examples is the gap between assets that are meant for speculative investment versus those that are meant for practical use. A significant amount of crypto revolves around the former. Indeed, if you've ever bought a coin, NFT, or other token with the hopes that it goes to the moon, then your investment was indeed speculative. Practical use, on the other hand, is both more mundane and, for now, far more rare. Despite Bitcoin Pizza Day, we're still a ways away from being able to buy a pack of gum at a gas station with crypto. Stablecoins are helping to bridge the gap, but most are hindered by negative carry costs, meaning that there's more use in locking those stablecoins up for a high yield than there is in using them to pay, say, your monthly electric bill. But use cases are slowly emerging. Paradox Protocol, a Web3 sports betting project, is a good example. Not only is it one of the few betting protocols that uses crypto as its medium of wager, but its zero custodial fees and unique early bet incentives make it stand out even amongst its Web3 peers. Throw in the potential to bet with root tokens that earn seniorage while you wait, and you've got a pretty revolutionary way to bet on Sunday football. I recently got a chance to talk with Karari, one of Paradox's founders, about how they got into this space and how all of Paradox's unique features come together. Well, Karari, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Rex. Really appreciate the uh, the opportunity to chat. Absolutely. How about you? Uh, how about you start us off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and and maybe how you got into crypto and then where Paradox came from? Yeah, hundred percent. So. It all kind of starts back when I was like seven or eight years old. Um, I started betting on sports through um, a website. Um, my dad was a trader, so we kind of always understood the, um, the importance of risk management and understanding probabilities, especially when making decisions. You know, that type of stuff is kind of universal um, in how you think about, you know, how you make your decisions, right? It really just comes down to risk reward. Um, so yeah, I started betting at a young age. Um, poker was kind of my first love. I would play like all the free poker tournaments on Poker Stars. Um, built up a bit of a bankroll. Um, I loved hold them. Um, but I, I, at the time, I would play any free game I could get. So I actually started playing PLO pretty early as well. Um, so I kind of did that for a while. That was like my almost like personality trait. You know, everybody kind of knew me as the, <laughs> the like uh, middle schooler who played online poker and like, you know, even elementary school, like that was just kind of what I, what I loved doing almost. Um, I was really enamored with Annette Oberstadt at the time, who was like the youngest player. I think she was 18 or 19 to win the world. She was a poker in Europe. And that was just so fascinating to me that, you know, these kind of kids were coming in and the game was changing. I could tell. And I, I thought it was like a, a really great opportunity. And I knew I was ahead of a lot of people because, you know, at this time, I'm like 11 or 12 playing, you know, it was like my main kind of hobby at some level outside of school. Um, but anyway, so Black Friday happens, which is basically means that the U.S. bans all online poker. Um, that's kind of where famous, you know, ultimate bet went bad. Absolute poker. All these sites kind of got shut down overnight. And it's kind of interesting because now I'm in the spot where it's like, hey, this thing that I've dedicated my whole, you know, like not my whole life, but, you know, my main hobby, my kind of identity. It's like, damn, well, poker's kind of done in the US and I'm 13 at this time, 13. So like, you know, it's not like I can go to a casino or, and I'm not going to move to Europe to play. So it's like, huh, what now? So I kind of start to get back into, into sports betting. Um, that's kind of at the time pinnacle was offering pretty much these unheard of really good odds. And they had a really unique business model around giving the best odds. Um, so I started kind of doing that more and more. I'll just kind of tell, you know, the people who, you know, my family members who I liked and then 
that kind of progressed to me getting a small account and then, you know, kind of building it up, same stuff. Um, but as kind of like a kid, I never really had the, the money management aspect. And I guess in a, in a vacuum, and this is very true with crypto, you can have edge on every single bet. Right. But if you don't know how to manage your money, you're always going to go broke because, you know, you could have 55 percent edge and you bet you could anybody can lose 10 bets in a row. Um, so I really didn't have that figured out as, you know, at that age. Um, so kind of as I as I grew older, Pinnacle eventually got shut down. Um, and so just um, a little context for people who are non-native to betting. Um, Pinnacle is offering minus 104, minus 104. So that would mean on a hundred dollar bet, you're risking one hundred four dollars to win one hundred. Right. When Pinnacle gets shut down in the U.S., now everybody's minus 110, minus 110. So now you're risking $110 to win 100, right? And that kind of difference is, is pretty large when you factor in that, you know, let's just say you're around break even at minus 104, minus 104. Now you're at 110, 110, you're actually losing money, right? And I think that plays a really interesting role in identity as well, right? So you kind of go from someone who's making money with a hobby to, to losing money, right? And gambling, it doesn't have to be, you know, super black and white, you know, it's just you're spending time doing something. And I think there's a big shift. And what I kind of started to realize is, hey, I might be able to hang around at 0404, but I'm not going to hang around at 110, 110. And so kind of at that time, I kind of, you know, I was started to get into daily fantasy sports, um, Drax, DraftKings, FanDuel. Um, that's kind of where my my attention shifted. And I did all right there. I was, again, I was pretty early, but again, you know, it just wasn't, you know, I wasn't a super big math guy. I wasn't a modeler. Um, so yeah, by the time I kind of headed off to college, I was like, not done with gambling, but um, I was kind of like, okay, let, let's see what, um, let's kind of open up a new chapter. Um, and kind of in between that time, I should say, I was a clerk on the uh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange while I was in high school. Um, and kind of through that experience, I learned that all these traders who were, you know, sitting in pits, you know, floor traders, they traded a lot of sports. They were constantly just trading, you know, are the Bulls going to win the NBA Finals? Oh, I'll give you 20 to 1. Oh, I want 18 to 1, right? And that's kind of when it really clicked that, hey, these people are all just betting with each other, right? And it was kind of surprising at that time, like, why hasn't this taken off, right? I mean, it's just more intuitive, more fun. Like, it, it's kind of the, the whole Uber, like, well, what if you just remove the middleman? You just connected people and you just kind of empower the consumer. And I just couldn't, for the life of me at the time, figure out why it wasn't a thing. So anyway, I go off to college um, and I get really involved in kind of, you know, I didn't really want to do a fraternity. So I wanted to kind of make my friends through doing clubs and kind of community service vibe with the kind of base idea that, hey, you know, these are quote unquote good people. Like say what you want. You know, they're dedicating their time to charity. They're, they're good people. Um, so I kind of did that for a year and a half and kind of through that experience, I, I learned a lot about um organizations in some ways a club that's raising money you know lots of money is kind of like um a little bit like a startup right you have to think very strategically all right how are we going to raise this money how are we going to you know mobilize people who want to help like it kind of got got into that realm for me um i was pretty involved in dance marathon at that time at university of illinois so i think we raised like three hundred thousand dollars um for uh, the children's hospital so kind of did that and then I don't know. I just one night I was just kind of in bed and I, I didn't really know what I really wanted to do. Right. It was kind of like at this point at the end of sophomore year where it was like, OK, hmm, I don't exactly have an internship lined up. I don't know if I want to do this charity stuff. You know, I don't really have any any obligations. I don't really know what I want to do. And I'm still trying to figure out what I'm passionate about. And I just get this idea and it's like, you know, build a peer to peer betting exchange. Right. And so. All of a sudden, I just as soon as I like hear the idea, have the idea, I just kind of cling on to it. I realize like this is what I want to do. This is I don't want people having power over me. I have this kind of mentality that if I never quit, I'm never going to fail. And I'm just like ecstatic. I'm like just laying in bed, just like I figured out what I'm going to dedicate my life to. Right. And it's kind of like, you know, like Eureka moment in a way where it's like this is and kind of the beautiful part about it is I at the time had this sense that. I'm not going to stop this, right? Like nobody's going to be able to take this quote unquote away from me. Like I can literally do this forever. You know, there's not anybody who has power over me in the situation. Like if I want to do this the rest of my life, there's, there's nothing stopping me. So that's a very you know, liberating point. But at that time, you know, I'm like 19, maybe 20 years old. I, I've never really run a startup before. You know, like my business experience is basically I sold stuff on eBay, you know, growing up, like that's pretty much it. And so, but I kind of had this mentality again, where I understood from pretty early on that I was going to have to learn by failing. 
And so I kind of always embraced the fact that I had no idea what I was doing in a sense, you know, that I was just going to throw stuff at the wall. If it worked, it did. And if not, I was going to learn something. And so I kind of start off and, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. Obviously, you know, I just fire in a way, make a business plan, you know, just fire away, fire away, fire away. And that kind of goes on. I start and I pretty much really start full time on the period of peer betting stuff, sophomore year, summer. And I, I'm just working the entire time. And that's kind of when I, I link up with my co-founder, even in Paradox today. Um, and what we talk about is, you know, we want to do this peer-to-peer betting stuff. And at this time in 2017, we're like, huh, how can we do it? So our first idea was, why don't we just do it on the dark net? <laughs> just like this ridiculous idea, like we're going to run a dark net betting site. <laughs> uh, obvious, obvious transition <laughs> Exactly, because you yeah. got to remember at that time, PAPS, it wasn't repealed. You know, there was no legal U.S. betting. So we were just like, all right, like, let's just go on the dark net and run a betting site. Like, you know, we, we didn't know what we were doing, like hardly knew how to code. Like, I didn't know how to code at all. Like, I, you know, I was like, oh, fuck it. That sounds dope. So we were like, all right, let's do that. And like, kind of like, all right, maybe like, you know, a few months in, we're like, all right, maybe this isn't the best plan. We're like, all right, let's take a step back. And that's kind of when Ethereum was starting to get on people's radar. Um, and so we were like, let's build an Ethereum betting exchange, right? You use smart contracts, nobody has custody of the funds, completely peer to peer, which is the vision, leverage new technology. This is a lot better than a dark net Bitcoin betting exchange. So we're like, all right, all in. So, you know, we started, you know, trying to figure out how we're going to do, you know, smart contracts. We, none of us really know how to code. We're just, you know, firing away, you know, <laughs> just like, oh, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. So we kind of, again, it is pretty much our full focus for you know, the next year. And we kind of get to the point, which this is our first project. We know nothing about code. And we kind of reach this point where we realize, hey, this is the first kind of encounter we have about scalable code. And our code is not scalable because every single time we want to change something, something else is breaking. And it's kind of reaching this point where we're like, we can't get this product to the point that we need to because, you know, if we change one thing here, the, the, this other thing stops working. We kind of hit a wall. And we kind of hit this realization like, hey, this is not this is not working, it's not reaching the point that we need to, it's not, it's not going to happen, right? Basically, essentially, but obviously, we're not going to quit, right? So we kind of find someone else, we're like, all right, let's, let's have them work on it. And what actually ends up happening is that summer, we end up getting into jump trading's incubator in the summer of 2018, um, at the University of Illinois, we were very lucky that jump for whatever reason, kind of took a liking to University of Illinois very early on. Obviously, they're being in Chicago. Um, they had their own like kind of research lab space and they ran an incubator. And, you know, at the time we'd been working on this for a year and it was kind of for new projects. So it was like, you know, kind of a perfect match. We kind of had a big edge over everybody else and that everybody's coming with new ideas. We've been working about it, thinking about it, obsessing about this for the past year. Um, so we end up getting in there. Um, we learn a lot about that experience. Um, it's a kind of our first time having money that we're using kind of to run a project. And quite frankly, we just don't spend it well. <laughs> we're just like, you know, kids, like we're teenagers, basically. And we, we got some money, you know, nothing crazy. Like I think the first investment was 35000 and then we got, you know, 35000 follow up. But, you know, we just don't spend it well. Same kind of issue with code, right? This time we're working with, you know, developers at the university, but it's still not like, you know, you know, they're just not, you know, there's a big difference between a freelance guy and someone who has actual interest in your project, right? And that's kind of what we learned that, hey, maybe the, the issue wasn't working with overseas developers, it was that, you know, these weren't in-house developers. So kind of same thing happens there, right? Like we kind of go, we go the whole summer, we're building the smart contract platform, you know, we're like, oh, we got it, we got it. And then we kind of reach the point where like, okay, like, huh, something's not right here. This is not working out. This is not going to work out. And we kind of reached that inflection point. And then we're like, all right, let, let's pivot. Let's do a, let's take the front end and all this stuff and let's remove the smart contract and let's do, you know, Bitcoin betting. Like, let's just simplify it. We're just going to be a bit Bitcoin betting exchange, right? Low fees, commission. We still think we're solving the niche. It's still there. Woo, woo, woo. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're kind of like, all right, let's, let's do that. We're going to restart. Um, but at this time, we've kind of spent most of our money. We don't got a lot of money left. Again, the developers, not very, you know, again, kind of committed, big thing, um, not super committed. Um, and so kind of as cash is dwindling down, the next of my senior year starts. So I go to this university of, you know, pitch fest thing. And I basically kind of pitch without being signed up to pitch. I just show up, pitch. And I meet this guy, and it turns out he's just a great developer. 
and he's from Russia. He recently built, you know, at that time, an app that had millions of users. It was basically a, a VPN around um, Russia's block on Telegram, and they went super viral. They had lots of startup ex experience, and it was a perfect match. And he kind of brought on his friend who also started that Russian company with, with him and um, kind of just locked in, and we, we built the whole thing from scratch. We were like, everything we have is, is totally worthless. Like, he's just like, this code just isn't scalable. So we're like, all right, let's, let's run it back. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna build it all over again. So by this time, you know, we're kind of easing into it, right? If things are going well. It feels like everything's going super good. Um, we kind of get like an MVP out. We're gonna run like a free contest, get some, get some feedback on that front. Um, and then we go, we kind of run the contest. It, it goes pretty well. I mean, we had like 600 people sign up to play. Um, so we go to jump and we're like, kind of doing our, our capstone pitch or whatever. And they just blow up at us. They just like, you haven't done anything. Like, woo, woo, woo. Like you ran a free contest, woo, woo, woo. You know, you guys have had this long, this long, woo, woo, woo. You know, we were, you were the only company to get follow-up investment. This is what you have. Your CTO is a 19 year old. Like they just blow up at us. And at that time, it, it's obviously, you know, not the best, but you, they never knew everything that went on behind the scenes with having to rebuild everything and go from scratch. So from their perspective, they're like, this is what you have. We're like, no, you don't get it. Like we built this in like two and a half months with like $15,000. Like we rebuilt everything and we got to this point. Um, but they were just, you know, they weren't impressed basically would be the, the easiest way to say it. Um, and so they, we were supposed to like go out to dinner with them after like, woo, woo, woo. like they were just like, no, don't, 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 don't bother, you know? <laughs> so they're like, kind of like, fuck you. We're like, all right, all right. But so kind of we're in the spot where we like, all right, now what we ran this free to play contest. I mean, it went all right. Like what's our, what's our next step? So free to play contest basically ends. And what we realized is we have a ton of users coming in from Venezuela. We're like, okay, why is that happening? Kind of like look into details. All right, like they all come like the last week. What's happening here? What's up? Well, the thing about Venezuela is they have no money, right? That's, that's very important. Their dollar is basically like $1 is now worth like, or I should say like $10 million is now worth like a dollar, like something like that. Like their money just got so inflated that their only way to send money to each other is crypto. Like, because they're completely socialist now. So they're all waiting in line for food and they have literally no money. So that's kind of the situation there. And we kind of realized that, hey, we were giving out a $444 top prize. This is a lot of money to them, right? This is, you know, this is like very, very exciting. So we reach out to the people and we're kind of like, hey, you know, like, we saw like a few of you were using the same IP addresses. What's up? You know, the, the first, second and third place guy were betting against each other. Like they, there's something going on with like they're trying to finesse the contest with multiple accounts. And so we reach out and the guy's just very honest. He's like, yeah, sorry, man. Like I created multiple accounts. I found you guys on Google. Like, I apologize. You can disqualify me if you want. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't know it was against the rules, like that type of stuff. And we're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. So then we're like, okay, well, we need to do something next, right? We didn't really get too much proof of concept. Jump seems like they're not really into us anymore. What are we, what are we going to do? And we're like, oh, let's build a free to play game for Latin America. And so we end up hiring the guy who cheated in our contest. He becomes like the only source of contact for anything in Latin America. We don't speak any Spanish. Like we're just like, ah, right, fuck it. We're just gonna, you know, figure this shit out. Like, so what we end up doing is we hire him. He translates the entire site to Spanish. Like we're just like all in. We're gonna be like a Spanish betting site. <laughs> That's gonna be. <laughs> it's gonna be peer to peer. We're like, all right, we're gonna figure this out. You know, like we're just not gonna quit. So try again. You know, get him and start like we have like literally nobody on the site when we launch because again we don't speak spanish we know nobody in latin america this is with bitcoin deposits we're like advertising in this like <laughs> this um spa this venezuelan sports media site called leader deportes like for like 50 dollars like a month and like we're just, we're just trying to figure something out so i just end up going up on twitter and just dming everybody i can the same spanish message about like check out this free-to-play game like like our old, cause we couldn't like make interesting tweets. We don't know Spanish. So like people would be able to tell that. So we are like, let's just copy paste, Google translate messages. Like, come on, like to influencers in the fetting world that speak Spanish from like Mexico and all these places. So that kind of goes on for like the first like two weeks, absolutely nothing's doing. Like we have like literally eight people on the site, like per day. It's like, all right, like what's, how are we going to figure this out? So <laughs> at that time, we kind of hit like a, a little bit of luck. We find a pretty good advertising partner called Baseball Sport, 
who's like willing to, you know, you got to remember these guys are willing to advertise for like $10, right? Because that's a lot of money for them. Like $10, you know, when you literally have no way of earning income is a lot. So we finally, we find a good partner and somebody comes from that and we basically blow up. We get like 3000 users over the course of one night. Now it kind of worked out really well because it was right when um, the World Series was happening. And Jose, that was when Jose Altuve and Juan Soto, it was Nationals versus Astros. And so there was like a big kind of like Latin American focus. Um, I believe Jose Altuve is from Venezuela. Um, so like there is this like, and then uh, Juan Soto is from the Dominican where we also had, you know, a lot of users. So people were just dying to bet on that game. And so kind of how we set up the site initially was you got 10 cents to start. So you get a free 10 cents. You don't have to deposit, right? You start with 10 cents, you make a bet. If you run out of money, you can claim 10 more cents, right? And so kind of the idea of the game is just engagement, right? You just kind of, you can keep playing. You can't really abuse it because you have to be totally out of money with no pending bets to claim more money. And you need $10 to withdraw. At the time, this was point, you needed one and BTC. It was all denominated in Bitcoin for some reason, but because we were paying out in Bitcoin, I guess that's kind of the, the key part. So anyway, that happens. Like a lot of people are using it. It's exciting. And now we're like, all right, like, what do we do next though? We have all these people playing for free, right? Like there, we know like some of them are creating multiple accounts. Like what, what are, how are we going to handle this? There's like people are abusing referrals, like, you know, you know, referring themselves. Like, it's like, all right, now we're in the same situation again, only larger scale. So you're like, all right, what are we going to do here? So we're like, all right, why don't we try to turn this into something around social media, right? Kind of with the idea that, Hey, Engagement is engagement. If you're getting a lot of engagement on social, that's going to push your stuff in a vacuum and, you know, build a brand around that and, you know, go, you know, try to be supreme for Latin America. Fuck it. <laughs> that's, that's not what we're trying to do. We're like, all right, like, let's figure that out. So kind of go that route. Um, you know, we, we had like to this day, like 11,000 followers on Facebook. We never ran a, a paid ad. So, you know, we, we got kind of this like base of users, but it kind of was like, all right, like, how are we we're not from venezuela we know nothing about venezuela like maybe we can try to platform some people maybe we can do this and that but we were also improving the site and trying to figure that out and then we kind of reach a stable point where we're like at like 400 users per day like a, a pretty solid amount but we don't really know what to do we're not making any money we're well past the point where we had you know we're, we don't have jobs we're just working out we're literally just professionally giving away money to people in venezuela and we, it's like, all right, like we kind of need to figure something else out. You kind of both, you know, pick up, you know, side stuff and then COVID hits. And then when COVID hits, it's like, all right, there's no more sports. Like we try to run esports, but we're like, this is not, not going to work. Right. So COVID hits, we're like, all right, now, now what are we going to do? Um, kind of at that point, we're like, all right, like what probably makes the most sense is, you know, we need to figure out an actual way to make money. Um, so then we kind of go, we're like, all right, we've kind of floated around this idea of doing like a COVID thing. We're like, okay, let's predict who's going to get COVID. We're like, ah, probably not that. Um, you know, just celebrities, like which celebrities are going to get announced COVID. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe not that. That's probably not it. We kind of, you know, try some stuff, not really like much going. So we eventually figure out like, all right, like a lot of people are betting peer to peer in group chats, Right. What if we just figure out a way to get these people betting peer to peer in group chats to bet with each other? Right. And that's kind of how Forecaster gets started. We basically have this site already built for exchange betting. We just kind of tweak it a little bit and we go to kind of <clears throat> large people in sports betting and say, hey, Telegram group chat betting is big. Right. Basic premise of Telegram group chat betting is I text a bet. Somebody just says accept. Right. There's not really any bells and whistles. It's just like group of people who know each other and they'll just kind of trade with each other. And so we ended up building custom software for that. And that's kind of where we first start making money is we, we, real, we kind of pinpoint the spot in the market that's not being addressed. We get in touch with the right people and, and we kind of grow. And the first year we launched, probably first full year, we probably do you know, a little less than 100 million in match volume year after we probably, this year, probably 100 million plus. Um, so we kind of figure out like our niche there and we kind of get to work with a lot of the top bettors in the world, right? Because a lot of these people are betting privately with each other already. Um, so kind of through that experience, we learn a ton about actual betting and how the industry really works. And our goal was always we wanted to spin this off in some way to crypto, right? Because right now, a limiting factor of forecasters is invite only, right? Because it's kind of like these 
group chats except user interface forums. So it's not like you can really have anybody joining. It's not really designed for that, right? So we kind of we kind of hit this point where we're like, all right, we want to figure out though how to get this order flow onto the blockchain. And this is in last year, last year around breakpoint last year. So that'd be like no early November last year. We're kind of like, all right, like let's blockchain's huge right now. This is when we got Ohm Wonderland. Everybody's you know printing money like it's just ridiculous. NFTs are popping off. You know, we're like, all right, we need to figure out how to get into this. Because um, we had the background, right? In 2017, you know, <laughs> that's what we, we tried to do initially. So we're like, all right, let's, let's try to figure out this. Um, so we kind of go that route and we're like, let's do a betting protocol on Solana. That's, that was our first plan. It was like betting protocol on Solana. And then we were like, all right, we don't know Rust. And then we were like, huh, why don't we just fork something on Solana? It's like nothing really exists. Um, we're like, okay, okay, what can we do? We're like NFT on Solana, something like that. You know, ultimately we just don't really do anything because it's not super clear. Um, and then what we end up doing is about a year later, Betdex kind of becomes about to launch and they're, they're going to open source their protocol. And we're like, why don't we just fork a, a betting exchange protocol? And then we start thinking. Nobody's going to provide liquidity on this, right? Because we know how hard it is to provide liquidity. Nobody's, this, these exchanges aren't going to get liquidity. They're not going to be able to incentivize it. All the people who are going to make money are going to be betting when LeBron James is out. So if this is not going to scale. It's not going to solve any problems for people we know. Um, you know, we're, we're just not, it, it, it's not going to work. We kind of know, we kind of know like what, what this is. Um, and so what we kind of realize is that we need to create a new mechanism for betting. That's basically what we realized in order to really cater to the users that we deal with who bet a lot of money. Nobody's going to, none of these people are actually going to post markets on the blockchain and just, you know, let other people just rip into them. So we kind of come up with the paradox and that's kind of how, <laughs> that's the long backstory of paradox. So we kind of go through all this and, and yeah, then we, we start paradox. Now this is, that is, that's awesome. That is, it's an awesome backstory filled with a lot of really interesting ups and downs. I mean, I'd love to go off on a tangent with you about like what you learned as an entrepreneur, but I want to get into paradox. Um, maybe we'll have to have you back at some point and talk about like the entrepreneurial experience, uh, but to, to shift towards paradox, yeah, you, you actually left me a really good transition point. So paradox um, is based on a, a paramutual protocol. Now, could you explain to me what exactly that means? Yeah, hundred percent. So parimutuel's biggest benefit is a few things. So number one, there's no technical limits to the amount you can bet, right? You're just betting a team with no predefined odds. Now, the biggest benefit of that is kind of, kind of twofold. So number one, for liquidity providers of people making bets, they don't necessarily have to worry about moving their price. Right. This is kind of a big friction point that a lot of market makers deal with and why, you know, market making on chain with any size is so hard is you're constantly moving your price. Right. There's kind of transaction associated with that. But on top of that, there's a lot of news that hasn't hit the market. Right. So, for example, LeBron James is hurt. You know, if you're seeding any substantial size, you're just getting fucked. You're not going to recover from that. There's not going to be enough liquidity. Right. So we kind of initially we know that's not going to work. Like it's just, nobody's going to want to book that other side. Nobody's going to want to offer, make those markets. Right. So then it's kind of like, how are these people going to be able to bet large amounts of money? Well, kind of the key thing and what we think about so cool about parimutuel is that the pools are always incentivized to rebalance. Right. So technically you could bet a million dollars into a pool. Right. And people are going to be incentivized to bet the other side, given that, let's just say the market thinks it's 50-50, but if you bet a million dollars, it's trading at 0.01%, right? So kind of the idea is that the market is always incentivized to rebalance back to kind of market odds. But at the same time, you don't have to worry about these injury news or anything with adverse selection bias. Um, so it's really designed to scale peer-to-peer -peer betting. Um, and then what we added to Parimutuel, which hadn't been done before, was this idea of commission kickback. So the goal behind that was basically to incentivize people to bet as early as possible, right? Because why would anybody come into the pool early and just get uncertain odds? So what we basically did is traditionally the house takes a, a certain fee for running the pool. It basically charges, you know, a small fee to the user. And then all of that money gets distributed to the people who have previously bet. And again, this mechanism is really designed to scale peer to peer betting um, and kind of service the type of people that we, we traditionally deal with on forecasters. 
So maybe a next sort of obvious question is how does how does Paradox make money? Yeah. So I think right now, like the real goal that we have is to create this um, betting community, right? Like this this um, open source kind of um, you know DeFi betting protocol. I think charging commissions externally is pretty easy at scale, right? We're not Snapchat or Facebook where it's like, all right, how are we going to figure out, you know, if people are betting, you know, billions of dollars, millions of dollars a day, it's not like how it's like, you know, how do you want to make money almost, if that makes sense. Um, and kind of the, the real goal with all of Paradox is really that it's community owned protocol. Um, I really kind of see, you know, starting it as like, just like, um, like kicking a, a boulder down the hill, ideally. And it's something that's just completely separate from us community owned um, and kind of just leave it up to the community to decide how they want to you know, make money on this or, or use it. Um, I don't think it's necessarily meant to be, you know, um, obviously you don't want to charge, we don't want to charge fees right away, just kind of in general, like extract rent. There's no real reason to. Um, I think it's just kind of something where it's like, it's in the same token where Uniswap wasn't like, all right, we're going to charge this fee that goes to the token holders. Kind of just like, all right, like if the token holders want to charge this, they can charge it. It's kind of kind of up to them. So I think with that, it's kind of a, a passive thing and something that I really would like the, the community to decide what's what's best. But I don't think it's like, oh, my God, how are we going to charge, you know, make money? I think it's just like, how do people want to make money, if that makes sense? No, that's that's a really good answer. And I appreciate it because I know that especially now, you know, in, in a bear market, you know, there are a lot of people thinking and talking about, you know, profitability and, and how, how do businesses actually make money, especially when, you know, things like advertising dollars are not where they used to be, or, you know, basic investment is lower, at least for the time being. And, um, you know, it's, it's to be thinking about that and talking about that is it's certainly something worth discussing. The, you, you talked a minute ago about this idea of that early incentive. And I want to, I want to go back to that for just a second. So basically what you're saying is, let's say that, um, you, me and Bella Bean Talk are going to, are going to bet on a particular outcome for a particular game. I'm in first, you're in second, Bella Bean Talk's in third, 1% of there's a there's essentially a 1% charge that's that really actually I would suppose all three of us are theoretically paying or is it just you and and Bella Bean Talk are paying and then based on our amounts put into the into whatever the pool is we're we split that 1% is that correct Yeah that's a good question so how it essentially works is if you're the first person in the pool you're paying no commission cuz you're technically just would just be paying it to yourself right now I'm the second person in the pool. Let's say I bet $101. You're going to get $1, right? So you get $1 right away. No questions asked. Doesn't matter anything else that happens. You have that dollar, right? Then Bella Bean Talk comes in. He bets $1,010, right? So we both bet $100, right? So we're going to split that $10 commission. I'm going to get five and you're going to get five. And so it's progressive on every single bet. And then, so let's just say you bet 100, I bet 100, and Bella Bean Talk has bet 1,000, right? Now somebody else comes in. Bella Bean Talk is going to get um, 10 twelfths of that next commission, right? So it's kind of like it's proportional based on how much you bet. So, you know, if you bet $10 early, that's not going to give you the same amount of commission as someone who bets 100000 I got you. And so essentially that just rolls over and rolls over right on through what, who, however long your, your line is of, of people betting in a particular outcome. Exactly, yeah. So maybe a silly question, maybe not. So that amount that rolls up, is that paid to your betters regardless of the outcome? So, you know, let's say that we're betting a Bulls game and you got a line that's, you know, 10 people long and we, uh, you know, we, there's a, a certain pool of money that's that's built up based on the line of, of wagers. And if we bet on the Bulls to win, the Bulls lose, that, is that still staying with your with the people who made the wager or is that going to the winners of the pool? The commission stays with the people. So if you lose a bet and you generated $10 in commission, you're still going to have $10 in commission to claim. So the commission is, is a separate pool. So in other words, I mean, essentially that's a way to help to offset a loss anyways, right? Yep. 
that's kind of the, what we're trying to do is essentially incentivize people to bet as early as possible and think about it as a way to earn real yields on kind of money with the kind of betting spin. So even if you're losing the bet, if you make double your money in yield because you got in super early and it was a super, there's a lot of volume in the pool, you know, you're still keeping that money you earn from commission regardless if you win or lose. Gotcha. All right. Appreciate the explanation. So one of the things that I've really appreciated about the story you've told is, you know, there seem to be a couple key themes, one of which, so like I said, we could go back and have a separate conversation about the entrepreneurship, which I think is really interesting. But, you know, I've really appreciated how, you know, one of the themes that you've talked about is this idea of decentralization and, um, you know, keeping things peer to peer and trying to stay away from, you know, centralized groups or management teams. And especially right now, you know, we're still talking, everybody's still talking about FTX and, and the hazards of centralization. One of the things that, um, that I noticed is right now that Paradox uses the multi-sig for confirmation. Do you have a plan to take that and move it away from a, a multi-sig to a, a decentralized Oracle or uh, another means by which to to confirm outcomes? Yeah, hundred percent. So it kind of bases off this theory that we believe that a fully decentralized Oracle is probably more likely to get an event wrong than an admin that's kind of confirming results. Um, so kind of especially in this stage, we thought it made the most sense to kind of start with that, right? Because you're still trusting a brand new system regardless, and I'd rather kind of have a human at the reins kind of watching it to start. Obviously, we understand that this is something that doesn't scale. But at the same time, we also realize that, hey, this is like the Oracle problem is something that's not really solved. Like, sure, you could use a chain link or you could do that kind of questions on how valid, how scalable that type of stuff is. So we kind of took the approach that, hey, this is the hardest problem and probably the one that, you know, in all honesty, betters care about the least. I mean, betters are used to trusting that FanDuel grades it correctly or, or anybody. And so we kind of took the approach that, hey, this is something that we want to solve. It's a very complicated problem to solve. And there's not a ton of upside that, you know, that there is for, for solving at this stage. The amount of time, effort, whatever that goes into it, we just didn't feel like it was aligned. But 100 percent, we, we understand that inherently we don't scale to what we need to be with any sort of centralization. The whole kind of idea really comes down to censorship resistance, right? I think that's what crypto is ultimately about. And, you know, when, when there is a multi-sig, it's theoretically censorable. But I think it's kind of one of those, you know, we just decided that it was best in the short term to kind of have some sort of, you know, reins on the, the score. Well, it seems like it seems like this area, sports betting, is probably one of the, let's say, one of the safer areas to use a multi-sig because the outcomes are so public. You know, so like as as we're talking and I'm thinking about, you know, we're, we're betting on a Bulls game. It's not a situation where like let's say that you know we had some type of pool around price changes for wheat futures or for bitcoin or whatever to determine the definitive truth in those situations takes a significant amount of effort but like the bulls game i can look in 70 different places on television, on the internet, in newspapers, and I can confirm as an individual, I can confirm the outcome of that wager. And so it almost seems like there's a certain amount of like commercial self-correction that happens. So like, you know, like if the multi-sig gets it wrong once, there's a lot of eyes. If they get it wrong twice, you are out of business anyway. So, you know, as, as you're talking and we're thinking about it, I mean, that, I guess that's what goes through my mind is it's, it's just such a transparent scenario. Yeah. And the crux is the score is coming from one place ultimately, right? So you're kind of decentralizing the centralized process of where the score comes from. Like once the, what the NBA says, the final score is, is the, is the final score, right? So you're kind of taking that and being like, all right, how can we report this decentralized? Like, again, definitely valid and, and important problem to solve. Ultimately, it just comes down to cost-benefit analysis. What's really, do we stand to gain by super decentralizing off the bat? Something probably is more likely to go wrong, you know, assuming that you, you trust that we'll, we have intentions to grade the scores correctly, which, you know, you can't really convince someone you have intentions to grade scores correctly, but I don't think we would spend all this time, you know, to not grade the scores correctly. Um, and I, I think that it, it just kind of comes down to that. It's the hardest problem and, you know, probably the least actual short-term solution. So that's kind of was the thinking behind it. Understand it's censorship 
not fully censorship resistant, but that's something that, you know, building toward. This is our first version. We want to get out for the World Cup. And that was kind of our thought process for it. We want a human to confirm any new decentralized Oracle in vetting. I just fundamentally believe that's the best route to start. Yeah, I think that's perfectly valid, especially especially getting off the ground and especially with scenarios that are so, so transparent. So I want to talk about Root a little bit. And so for those who, um, those of you that are listening that aren't particularly familiar with with the root token. So um, the root token is a wrapped silo deposit. So Beanstalk protocol has a number of tokens and it has a number of functions, one of which is what we call the silo. And when an individual deposits beans into the silo, um, that silo deposit is, is locked until the silo deposit is redeemed for beans. While it's in the silo, it earns passive interest. And so having that silo deposit locked is somewhat limiting. So um, part of the group involved with Beanstalk has built a system for wrapped silo tokens, um, and they're referred to as root tokens. Those root tokens are then able to be used in really a variety of different protocols. The first use case is with Paradox. Now, Karari, when it comes to root and paradox how are how are you using root tokens for specific betting scenarios yeah so what i think is super interesting that root kind of taps into is this idea that i should be earning interest on my long-term bets right so kind of the the basic idea is that you know root allows me as a as a user who's holding the root token to tap into kind of yields um, while I wait for a bet to happen, right? That's something that we think is a, a limiting factor in making these long-term bets that, you know, hey, if I have my money tied up for six months on who's going to win the NBA championship, right? I, I don't know if, you know, I, I could probably get higher yield than, expect, than my expected value, right? It's doing something else with that money. So Root kind of allows us to tap into this idea of giving people, you know, some sort of incentive for making a long-term bet. Um, that was something kind of we always wanted to tackle. We see a lot of opportunity in this, this long-term market where, you know, there's a lot of problems for a regular better. There's not high limits, right? You know, you have to tie up your money for a while. There's high spreads, right? You're paying two times the amount of commission on a long-term bet versus short-term bet, like a regular single game bet. And so kind of all those things combined made us think that, hey, the best route to go about this is to kind of incorporate some way to give people, you know, passive yield on these long term bets. And we kind of talked to Root about and thought they were a great match for, you know, a number of reasons. And I think kind of we're both kind of, you know, starting like um, together, which is which is kind of cool. Like we, we launched together and I'm sure we're both going to kind of grow and, and expand. And I think it's it's really exciting to be able to, you know, you know, grow with Root kind of as they, they continue to expand. Um, their product and their, their coin. Absolutely. So, so if I'm understanding this right, you know, the example you're using is the one that's in place right now, world cup winner betting, uh, using root. And I, and for, um, for the sake of those listening, so that, that pool is closed. So unfortunately, if you're listening to this now and you think, Oh, that's a great idea. I should go in and in place of bet. It's that's, it's closed. So unfortunately you can't, but the concept stands that, you know, we've got a contest that isn't going to be decided for a number of weeks. And so a couple things are occurring, if I'm understanding this correct, Karari. So while, while wager placing was open, while we could still place bets, if I'm the, if I'm the first person that says Brazil's going to win the world cup, you know, obviously a favorite, you know, I'm, I'm putting my, putting the first wager on Brazil as a winner. Every subsequent wager, I am getting that 1% commission or a portion of, I should say that you referred to earlier. So that's, that's stacking up as, as a commission since I was early in. And then now we've got a scenario where betting is closed, but between now and when that the decision is confirmed, when you know, whenever whenever the World Cup finishes and, and a winner's decided, I've got the ability to earn passive yield on the root tokens too, right? Exactly. And I think that's pretty revolutionary. And you know, I think that 
that's something that I think will be more prevalent in betting as a whole, but it's not something I've seen done anywhere. And so it's kind of cool to be, you know, kind of tapping into that. And I think the timing was perfect with us and Root. And um, I think it's something that we're going to continue to do. And it's, you know, a really big long-term value add for the user because the pool that they can win is growing. Everything is is growing even when you're not doing anything. It's it's the same as sitting in the beanstalk silo, only, hey, like you're getting entertainment value from it. And I think that's really cool. And I think there's going to be a number of different root use cases. I think this is just the the first of many to come. But I, I think it's um it's a, a super exciting project and we're really excited to to launch the uh, the World Cup pool with them. So, you and you'll have to forgive me. I am not. I'm green as a blade of grass when it comes to really any kind of betting. I like it, this is new to me. Like I'm the guy that walks through a casino, loses a hundred bucks at a blackjack table, and says, "Okay, you know, I've had my fun." When when you think about short term or, or or long term, let's stick with long term because we've been talking about root. When you think about like long term wager opportunities, like I feel like I feel like the world kind of opens up. I mean, it could any be anything from like who's going to win the next presidential election to uh, it seems like you know there are just kind of a limitless number of options. Really, anything where people might disagree on an outcome, right? Yep, exactly. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's it's um, the idea of a prediction market for for anything is you know really exciting to us and that's where we think it's kind of all going in a sense right i mean sports are kind of the, the biggest use case but you know it's betting on everything right and i think you know we'll only see more and more betting in the world it's kind of a great way to you know understand what true probability of things are right to aggregate opinions right who really cares what somebody says if you're not going to bet on it it's kind of the the idea you have to quantify your beliefs and i think that's the um that's the premise that we're working on and that's what we want to kind of bring to the masses and you know i think that um the amount of markets that can be offered are, are really endless and it's, it's going to be super exciting to really kind of scratch the surface on what <laughs> what what the next generation of betting is really going to look like because i think it's going to be a lot different from what you see now and i would like to quantify one more thing like i feel like this idea of betting versus gambling is actually pretty different right so if you go and play blackjack you know you go for 21 you know you don't you know you don't have odds same with roulette there's there's a built-in edge when you're betting, you could theoretically have value, right? There's people who, who make money betting, right? You're kind of playing in, in a market, right? The same with kind of the you know, stock market in a sense. Um, although you could argue that's more positive some, but but generally speaking that there is, you know, you could have edge in these things where when you're gambling, when you're playing a casino, right? You're never gonna have any edge, you know? You're not, you're not spinning the slot machine, you know, and knowing that, hey, you know, I'm gonna actually might be having expected value here right it's just you're you're basically paying money for entertainment i was just going to say that it sounds like the difference that you're describing is if i'm going to a casino i'm paying money to have a good time knowing that most likely i'm going to walk out with quite a bit less money than when i started with whereas what you're saying in you know market making or in in a betting scenario you've got the opportunity to understand the parameters around the different components and make probabilistic decisions and potentially see positive value. Exactly. And I think you're, no matter what you're contributing to kind of this human algorithm that is, you know, basically collectively pricing an event, right? And so I think that data in itself is valuable. Um, it'll be kind of valuable for AI in the future. I think that's, you know, it's kind of like contributing to the human collective consciousness at some level, right? Because no matter what, you're kind of giving information on what you're thinking about an event, which can kind of be tied, you know, to better predictions, right? I think if you, you know, who's betting what, like this and that, you know, you can kind of really start to refine, you know, what the actual odds are of something. And I think that's where it's, it's all heading um, in the long term. That's very interesting. So to look specifically at paradox. So, you know, obviously we've talked about like how wide the horizon can be, but like paradox, I'm sure you guys have some pretty specific things that you're looking at in the near term. Obviously you got the world cup, uh, going both the long-term winner, um, wagers that have, that have closed. And then, you know, there's, I'm seeing a handful of different games that are, that are open. Um, that it's, you know, basically just happening day by day. I'm seeing football, uh, both NCAA and NFL games. What are what are you looking at in terms of 
your next opportunities? Are you looking at specific sports or other things? What's, what's the vision? Yeah, I think um, the key thing that we, you know, are still working on, you know, we've been out for like a week is figuring out what exactly our niche is, right? Or niche or however you want to say that way. But um, I think that, you know, soccer and World's Cup was like perfect timing to launch this because the biggest event in the world. But at the same time, this is the event with the most competition for betting, right? Because you're competing with attention for with all these different companies. And I think as we kind of head more and more into the future, you know, we understand how important it is when starting something, right? Same thing with forecasters is to fill like a specific niche, right? And so kind of right now it's like cast a wide net. This is the event everybody wants to bet on. You know, maybe we hit a home run, maybe, you know, something that becomes really big. Or maybe, you know, we go through this, we pick up a few users, we take some feedback, and we kind of target something more specific. And I think it's a, a play-by-ear approach. I think definitely World's Cup is, you know, our focus for the next month, um, figuring out how to get as many people as possible into these pools. We think, again, it scales really well. So I think that's really cool. But at the end of the day, I think it's a, it's a day-by-day approach with us, really. You know, it's kind of like just tweaking some stuff, figuring out where, you know, the most demand for this is, and then kind of go off. So to answer the question, and like, I guess the simplest way is that, you know, we understand that we want to fill like a niche and we don't fully know what our niche in the market is right now, but I think that we want to continue to grow. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's all you can hope to do. And it sounds like because of how open the opportunities could be, you've got a lot of different places that you could look for that niche. Again, you know, you know, we've talked about sports betting, but, you know, the idea that, you know, any type of market making has that opportunity. Uh, it is, it's hard not to believe that with things like elections being so public that there wouldn't be an opportunity in that area or, or some other niche that, that you may find that you think, wow, this is really a unique market fit for for a product exactly yeah i think um it's kind of the scope is really endless at a level which is like good and bad because it's kind of like you know not not bad but it's like disorienting in a sense because there's so many different markets and it's like the the best move to just have all the markets and see where people flow or is it the best to kind of focus on targeting a specific person right like who who is this really really built for right kind of we've always assumed that this is built for high high stakes betters right and that that kind of is you know that's the niche is like basically somebody who wants to bet a lot of money and doesn't really have a have a place to do it in a decentralized manner because you know we don't really believe that a decentralized you know there's there's really a way to do that decentralized um so i think that we want to basically bring these large betting markets to the blockchain but we're still trying to figure out what exactly that that looks like for the user well thanks for joining us karari definitely appreciate your time thanks rex It it was a blast You can find Paradox on Twitter at BetParadox and on the web at BetParadox.com. The Bean Pod is a production of Beanstalk Farms, a decentralized autonomous organization. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Medium, Discord, and our home on the web at bean.money. You can also find me on Twitter at RexTheBean. And as a final reminder, this podcast is not financial advice. Thanks again for listening.